I just want I just want to thank you. I want y'all to know that music's been sounding great. Last week it was awesome. Amen. I mean Sunday it was awesome. Praise God. You know, so man, it's just a blessing. And then, you know, I don't know if right there in that last song, y'all were just all singing harmony at the same time. And I was just like, man, this sounds so good, you know. So I just want y'all to know that it's not, it's recognized. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Everybody's doing tonight. Y'all doing okay? That was a good song service, I think. Praise God. The presence of the Lord is in the house. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Aren't y'all excited? Don't you excited when you feel the presence of the Lord? Yes. Amen. Amen. You know, that's part of being Pentecostal, is that you can feel His presence. Amen. 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 His presence is palpable. Amen. You can feel Him. Praise God. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be part of no old dead, dry religion, man. I want to be able to feel the presence of the Lord. Amen. We need to bring some people over here from the old church. Maybe I need to start acting like the old church. They all running, man. Whenever I feel it, when I'm feeling like that, Joey, man, we need to invite Joey Duga over here. Remember how he used to do a can meet? Y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. That brother used to take all the money. I remember brother shot, dude. Oh yeah, brother shot, take all the money, dude. I got an announcement to make. Just give me one second. This is for you, mostly, uh, uh, Robert. All right, October twenty fourth. If you have nursery, you need to make arrangements, sir, because Paris Reagan will be preaching from this pulpit. Praise God. Amen. amen. Brother Paris Reagan, amen. Praise God. He was alone. He's an alum, <laughs> alumnus of, of Naya and Angie. And if you can't find nobody to take your spot, I'll take it for you. I just announced I'll bring you to. Praise God. So anyway. He's an alumnus of uh, Angie and Naya. Did y'all all graduate together, or was he? Yeah, a, we went to school together. Yeah. So anyway, God's been using him, but uh, he's really got man, the Lord, really got, explaining yeah. the gospel in a very succinct and understandable way. Amen. So we're excited to have him. Praise God. All right, October twenty fourth. You want to be here on Sunday? All right. <laughs> this is how we're going to handle Daniel chapter nine. It's very, it's very long. But this is going to be a two-part installment on Daniel 9 because it's probably, it's an extremely important chapter because, again, as far as I understand or as far as I know with all of my studies, and I'm open if somebody knows something different. I know Aaron's been studying the end time stuff a lot lately, but anybody else, um, as far as I know, this is the only place that we find a seven, uh, uh, a notation about a seven-year period in the end, okay? In the book of Revelation. 42 months, uh, uh, 1260 days, according to the Jewish lunar calendar, repeatedly. In the book of Daniel, time, one year, times, two years, and half a times, three and a half years, repeatedly. Uh, in the book of Revelation, again, but three and a half years is repeatedly mentioned, but as far as for a whole seven year period, in the book of Daniel, chapter 9 is the one place that we find that. So I want to make that clear, right? Because it's a lot easier if we just get it all out in the front. And again, if you find other information that says something different, please bring it forward. But this is the place in Daniel 9. It's actually until we get to verse 24 is when it begins to really explain this. But I just want you to understand, again, the book of Revelation and other places, three and a half years is repeatedly mentioned in various ways. But the seven-year period it starts, we get that concept from Daniel chapter 9. And it all is intertwined and gives us that last seven-year period. That's what I call it, the last seven, all right? That's what I'm calling it now. I'm not calling it the tribulation. I'm not calling it mid-trib. Well, you might hear me say mid-trib, pre-wrath. I'm not calling it pre-trib. I'm calling it the last seven. That's my title for it. You know, and, and that's fine. As long as you understand that when I say the last seven, that includes what people have talked about before, the seven-year tribulation, and all the, the wrath of God is involved in that, and all, all of these things comes in this last seven. We got that? We, we're all clear on that? Let's move forward. Here we go. So it starts off with Daniel praying to the Lord, okay? In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes. So if you'll remember, we've already talked about all this history. The Babylonian Empire came in, took Daniel. Daniel was there when the, when the Medo-Persian Empire took over. So he's saying it right here. Darius was a Mede. 
And this was uh, the, the, Darius was the son of Ahasuerus. And so this was the Median Empire before the Persians took over. This is the time when the Lord spoke to Daniel about this chapter 9, seven year period that takes place at the end, okay? Of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, okay? That's talking about the Babylonian Empire, but the Medes had taken over now. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. All right, so let's understand this. So Daniel is praying to the Lord. He's seeking an answer for God's people who, who, who are the children of Israel. And he says, I understood by the books, okay? He's talking about the word of God that they had at that time. And he's saying that he started to understand the word of the Lord which had come to Jeremiah the prophet. That he would accomplish. So God had told Jeremiah the prophet some things before Daniel, and now Daniel's seeing the, the he's being reminded of the of the words that were spoken to Jeremiah the prophet. Now let's let's go here real quick. Y'all remember we're in Daniel chapter two. Let's see what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah twenty five verse eleven. Here we go. Jeremiah the prophet. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. Now, if you remember the history of Israel, I've tried to teach it many, many times since we've been in this church. I've written so many chronologies on the board, probably to the point where y'all like, dude, quit making chalk dust fly in the air. But one of the it, it, very important time frames of Israel's history, if you don't understand the history of the Bible, you're going to have a very difficult time really understanding the context of what we're talking about. All right, so let me just remind you that we come from the Tower of Babel, we come over to next God called Abraham, and then we come to the time frame that they were in Egypt, and then they're released and they come, you know, we go through the Judges and Joshua, but you remember when they finally came into the land, in the time frame of the Judges, if you'll remember, what did they do? Because we've preached on that many times, we want a king. You remember when they said that? They didn't want to be, they didn't want to be different than the other nations. We want a king! Okay, God says, okay, well, I'll give you Saul. You didn't want to wait for David, but I'll give you Saul. Well, then, then comes David, and now who comes after David? Anybody remember the third king of Israel? Solomon. Solomon. What did Solomon do? Solomon did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Did he not? Yes, he did. He built temples for the women that he married to the god Chemosh, to the god Molech. He did, Solomon did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Let's just call it what it is. The Bible talks about it because what did it do? It caused a split in the kingdom of God. The upper ten tribes of Israel and the two lower tribes of Judah, Benjamin and Judah, were stayed together. The other ten were, okay, then comes the time frame of the kings. And during the time frame of the kings, also corresponding with the time frame of the kings of the prophets. God keeps it because all the kings, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He, he reigned for 25 years and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not have the heart of his father David. He had the heart of Solomon or he had the heart of Jeroboam and he did wicked in the sight of the Lord. And then while like I preached about two months ago on Josiah, Josiah, the young man of God rose up and what did you remember that? Oh dude, I feel the Holy Ghost all over. I, pre I remember preaching that. He said, Dig them up, dig up the bones of those lying prophets and burn them on the altar. What? They ain't nobody did it like Josiah, right? But that's one in the midst of how many kings. But the whole time during the time frame of kings, God sent a prophet after prophet after prophet. And he's telling them, turn from your ways, turn from your ways. And the people ridiculed the prophets and they scorned the prophets and they chastised the prophets. And so they refused to listen to the prophets. And so in the end, the Lord speaks to Jeremiah, the prophet, right there before this whole thing goes down in the Babylonian empire. You remember the story. Daniel's a teenager, right? And they come in to get him. But before that, Jeremiah had already prophesied. All right. And, and it says, this is, the, this is the word. Look, the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, the Lord speaks when the righteous are speaking the word of the Lord. That was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even unto this day, that is the three and twentieth year, the word of the Lord has come unto me, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but you have not hearkened. In other words, you didn't want to listen. The Lord has sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not hearkened. 
nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, again, he, they said, turn ye again now everyone from his evil way and from the evil of your doings and dwell in the land that the Lord has given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. Go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands and I will do you no hurt. Yet you have not hearkened unto me, says the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, Behold, I will sin and take the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. Now look, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't serving the Lord whenever God, you know, everybody's a servant of the Lord. When God puts it in his hand to, to, to make things happen on the earth, they are all servants of the Lord. He is in control. Nebuchadnezzar, at some point in time, his heart was humbled. And yes, he glorified God. But the Lord's saying, no, he's my servant because he's in my hand and I will use him how I see fit. And I will accomplish what I desire to accomplish through him. And that's what he did. He said, I will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth. That's a joy. That's a song of joy. And the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones. In other words, there's not going to be any harvest, my friend. You're not going to hear the sound of a millstone breaking up the grain. There's no more harvest. And the light of the candle. Because you know why you know harvest? Because you're going to be in another land. You're going to be in Babylonian captivity. And when you're in prison, you can't be producing a harvest. Right? And this whole land shall be desolation and astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon. Here it is right here. 70 years. Now I got to tell you that that's a very important number. 70 years. 70 years because you know why? He wanted the land to be able to lie desolate. Why? One of the biggest problems that God had with all this stuff, it was bad enough that Solomon built all these temples and that they were worshiping these false gods and God kept telling them, don't serve these false gods. But you know what else they forgot in the middle of it all? They forgot that they were, they were, they were living on God's turf. Do you understand that? Yeah. This whole earth belongs to the Lord, but that little sliver sliver of land, that, that's really special to God. And when, you know what he told them in the law of Moses? He said, every seventh year is going to be a Sabbath unto you. See, just like, and ultimately we understand Sabbath is a rest. God created and on the seventh day he rested. And what the Sabbath was to represent was actually the fulfillment of Jesus. And our true rest comes in Christ. Amen. But he was very serious. He said that not only will you rest on the seventh day of the week, but every year, every seventh year, your land is to rest. You're not, gonna, you're not supposed to plow the land. You're not supposed to sow the seed. You let the land provide for you in that seventh year. And I'm telling you, I will pour out a window out of the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. But you're going to have to trust me. You see, it's all about faith, my friend. Yeah. God is a God of faith and his hand is moved by faith. And many times we take matters into our own hands. Oh, it's the seventh year. I don't know if I can trust him. Let me just go ahead and put my hand on the plow. Let me just go ahead and do it anyway. Don't put your hand on the plow, Christian. I mean, listen, get up and go to work tomorrow. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> work harder than everybody else in the company if you can. That's what the Lord will have you to do. But what I'm saying is when it comes to spiritual things that the Lord's speaking to, you don't try to make everything happen and try to maneuver. You get the point. Let the Lord have his way. I wanted you to see that though. 70 years. And we're going back to Daniel now. We're going back to, to the Daniel chapter 9. And then I wanted you also to see uh, how that other scripture was in Chronicles. Second Chronicles. And it just kind of repeats. Uh, or it's another way. You know what the Chronicles are? So the kings, they kind of like the first and second Chronicles kind of in a way repeat first and second kings. But it kind of just comes at it from a different angle, okay? So it's worthy to read it all because it just kind of like even solidifies it in your heart, especially if you read through, right? But look, Zedekiah was 21 and 20 or 21 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did that which was evil. You see there, there's an example right there of what I was talking about. He did that which is evil in the sight of the Lord his God and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. But he stiffened his neck. Oh, Lord, help us, huh? I don't know if that speaks to you or not, but how many times has old Matt stiffened his neck and decided, I'm not going to do what you're telling me to do, Lord. I'm just going to be a stiff-necked and rebellious person. Yeah. He stiffened his neck and he hardened his heart. I love to preach yeah. like that because guess what? I'm preaching to myself half the time. 
Hopefully you learn to love my preaching and you know that if I'm preaching it to you, I'm preaching it to me. Amen. Amen. From turning unto the Lord God of Israel, moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgress very much after all the abominations of the heathen. And put that, in other words, the people of God living like the people of the world and the house of the Lord, which he had uh, uh, polluted. Then, then and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up be times and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets. Look at that. That's exactly how I don't even remember reading all this. I guess I did, but... It's the same thing I was just saying. Until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, Nebuchadnezzar, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young man or maid, an old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. All the vessels of the house of God. Remember that we just preached about all. Great and small and the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king and of his princes. All these were brought to Babylon. And they burnt the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, and burnt all the power. Look at that. I want you to see that because look, when we get into Daniel 9, this is all connected to this. The house of God lay waste, burnt, burnt down. The city is in rubble. Okay, can you imagine a war-torn city? I mean, you see the devastation from the hurricane, right? Y'all been driving, y'all been to Homa yet? Okay. Y'all were in Homa like after the, the mess? I mean, look, it's a mess, right? You got rubble everywhere. Stuff piled up on the sides of the road. That that people's houses, like, so messed up. Some of y'all, I mean, Wade and Robert probably seen worse stuff over there in Luli. And when you get further to Laplace, I mean, dude, the winds were bad. Point is, is devastation and desolation. That's what worn, torn areas look like. That's what Jerusalem looked like. The city was war torn. The city was beat down. God allowed it to happen to bring chastisement upon us. It's something that we got to understand. I was sharing with somebody today. I don't remember who it was. But look, uh, so people have been asking me about their kids. Like, oh, what do you recommend I do? Well, look, I'm going to tell you what I know the Lord put on my heart. It didn't turn out exactly the way I expected, but it doesn't mean that it wasn't right. And in the end, this is what you got to be able to do. Ch children of God, if you have children, this is what you got to be able to do. You're going to be have to be able to sleep at night. I've shared this with the church before, and I'll share it again. What, Danielle and I prayed for the kids. We prayed. We did pray. I know we did. But one thing I will say for me personally is I wish I just would have prayed more because I don't think you can pray enough. Does That's that make right. sense? I, I instructed. I disciplined. But get, but, and, and you know what? And I did pray. But I don't think you can pray enough. Amen. You can't never pray enough. That's and right. one thing I'll say, though, is this, is that I can lay my hand on my pillow at night. And I believe Danielle would probably say the same. I know a mother's worry is a little bit of a different way. But I can lay my head on my pillow at night, and I know that I was involved with my girl. I know that I told them the truth. Yeah. Every way, no how. I know the other day, Wade, we were in a meeting, and Wade said, you need to tell them three, the same thing three times, but three different ways to make sure they understand yeah. it. And that's what we did with our girls when it came to the gospel. At least three times, three different ways. And I can lay my head on my bed pillow at night, even though things have not turned out the way that I would have expected. That doesn't mean it's over. Amen. The Lord got the last say so, my friend. Hallelujah. Amen. He is. Yeah. Hey, look, Jonah, he'd be in the mouth of the whale, in the belly of the whale, and the Lord will vomit them up on the other on the shore. They'd be all tangled up with seaweed and, and, and whale bile all over them. And time to get up, wake up, and ho! Oh! Lord, where I've been, I've been so long. You know what? The Lord knows how to get a hold of folks. I know what I'm talking about. So the Lord got the last say. So. But what I'm trying to say is, in the meantime, Jesus. you know, sometimes the enemy will try to wear you down, beat you down, right? Yeah. And, 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 and you know, like you didn't do it. No, no, no. You're a liar, devil. I did everything I knew to do, and I did it all for the purpose of trying to raise godly seed. And in the end, it's God's. It's it's on you now, Lord. It's on you. I mean, I need to pray. I still need to pray more. Don't you need to pray more? Yes. But look, that's one thing you don't want to do as a parent is look backwards and regret. Listen, sometimes things happen in our life. Sometimes we don't know the Lord whenever our children are growing up the way we know the Lord now. Don't sit there and live under condemnation and guilt for that. Start today. Get on your knees. Pray for your kids. Try to be loving. Let the Lord do a work in your heart and in my heart. Amen. You get the point I'm trying to make. I don't even know how I got all there other than war-torn Jerusalem is what I'm really trying to talk about. It's yeah. a mess. People's lives are a mess. Look, the name Jerusalem means the city of peace. Ain't no peace in Jerusalem right here. 
It's messed up, right? All the palaces there of fire destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof, and them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah till the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. You see there? You remember when I said that? Seventy years. You don't want to give my land her Sabbath? I'll take it. Because it belongs to me. And you will be captive for these 70 years. Okay? And so, so for as long as she lay desolate, she keeps the Sabbath. So if that's the way that I got to get my Sabbath out of you, then that's what I'll do. I'll put the land desolate. I want you to think about, wow. look, three score and 10 years. A score is 20 years. I know that's old King James, but look, a score is 20 years. So three score, three times 20 is 60, plus 10, 70. 70 years. I want you to remember that word desolate. Because listen, Jerusalem ain't never been the same. You hear me? Oh, they might have, listen, they might have a, the city might have a wall. Or the remaining wall is the Wailing Wall. That still you see those Hasidic Jews over there with the little curly cues. That ain't even real Judaism, but we ain't got time to go there. But that city has never been the same. You hear me? It's never been the same. Okay. And, and, and what I, because look, it's still desolate. It's still not right. The presence of the Lord is not in the city. There's not a temple there. The president, we understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of that. But what I'm trying to make a point is God's presence always dwell with his people in the temple. In the Holy of Holies. Build, my, build me a sanctuary that I might dwell with my people, Exodus 25 8. Beyond the, the veil, in the Holy of Holies, between the cherubim, where you put the blood, sprinkle it seven times, this is where I will meet with you. There is no temple there. Just as, just as in the book of Samuel, whenever the children of Israel took the ark to try to fight the Philistines. And on that day, they stole the ark of co the covenant of God. And Hophni, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, what was it? Yes, it was, uh, it was Hophni and Phinehas, right? And what happened? Eli gets the message and what happens? He dies. He breaks his neck. You remember that? You remember the high priest was Eli and he got the news. They took the ark. They took the ark and he falls backwards and he breaks his neck. And one of those boys, one of his boys, wives was pregnant. And she, and she named their son Ichabod. Mm. For the presence of the Lord has left this place. Ichabod. And listen, it's been, it ain't been right since. Yeah, I mean, during the Solomon's time, the presence of the Lord showed up and the priest couldn't minister. Yeah. But guess what? The, the, the rebellion of Solomon results in this. Okay. It still ain't right, my friend. There is no temple on the, on the, on the, on the, the temple mount. You know what there is? There's a dome of the mosque. Still desolate is the point that I'm trying to make. Oh, the Lord's going to make it right. It's going to all come back, but for a greater, for another purpose. See, because the enemy's going to, the enemy's going to be behind some of this. You understand that? He's going to build a temple. They're going to rebuild a temple, but for the whole purpose of the rebuilding of this temple, let us understand that. Let us be wise. Okay, I know that this is out of context, but let us be wise and calculate the number. Let us count. Let us understand what's going on. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but there ain't going to be no peace in Jerusalem until right. the Prince of Peace shows up. And as a matter of fact, if there's peace in Jerusalem before Jesus shows up, it's a counterfeit peace. And he's a liar. And he's the Antichrist, not the Christ. And they're going to build a temple over there. And on the wing of the temple, he will exalt himself and demand to be worshipped. So I'm just trying to say it's desolate. There's a time frame of desolation. And even Jesus talked about it. We preached about it out of Matthew 24. When you see the abomination of desolation that was spoken of by the prophet Daniel, flee to the mountains. Yep. What he's talking about, listen, the place is desolate now, but there's coming a time when there's going to be another abomination that causes desolation, just as there was during these time frames here, where I told y'all already about Antiochus Epiphanes or whatever the case, how the things that he did and how he put that swine on the altar, guess what? In a similar, and he said, exalt me, worship me. That's what Antiochus said, that Grecian king, in a similar fashion, that's what the Antichrist is going to do. When that temple is rebuilt, he's going to elevate himself in the temple and he's going to demand to be worshipped as God. But I want you to see, I wanted you to see these, these, 
because all this has to do with Daniel's prayer right here. All right, we're going to keep moving forward. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years, 70, where the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish it. 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So after the 70 years, you remember what God did, he, he put it on King Cyrus's heart. You remember Cyrus was the Persian king, and you remember Nehemiah was his cupbearer. Y'all remember that story? If you haven't read it, it's okay. We're gonna, we'll get there sooner or later. We'll come back and we're going to do it all over again. But Nehemiah was his cupbearer. And, and he was downcast because he had heard what Jerusalem looked like. And, and, and the king, Artaxerxes, I believe, no, it was Cyrus, I'm sorry. Cyrus said, what's wrong with you? He said, I just got news of this, my city, my beloved city. It's burnt to the ground. Won't you please give me permission to go back and to help restore it? Cyrus gives an edict that allows them to go back and to start restoring the city. Very important that you catch that. That is what Daniel 9.24 is all about. Daniel 9.24, when we're about to get there, it says from the edict to rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, there was a certain amount of time. We're about to get there, but I want you to understand that. All this is built into the history of Israel. This is a lot of information. I get that. But if you're ever going to understand it, listen, you know how many times I had to hear people preach about this and how many times I had to read it and how many times I had to study it before I even had a clue? A lot. Because there's a lot of information here. But I want you to understand it's all within the word of God. Okay? He said, I set my feet, my face to the Lord God to seek by prayer, supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. What does that mean? That means he was really serious about praying. <laughs> It means he was really in a lot of pain for his city and his nation. Okay. I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O oh Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping covenant. You know, God's so good. He never, God always keeps his end of the deal, right? Yes. And we're the ones that mess it up. Come yes. on, church. Help me out. Yes. And mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. You want mercy in your life? Just follow <laughs> the Lord. Amen. Yes. Let's follow the Lord. Amen. We have sinned and have committed. Look at Daniel. He keeps himself in there. And that's the one that was in the lion's den. Daniel's the one that said, I'm not going to eat your meat and drink your drink. But yet he's putting himself in there because he knows he's not perfect. We have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedly our, our nation and our city. We've rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we hearkened or listened to your servants, the prophets, which, you, which spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers. And to all the people of the land, O oh Lord, righteousness belongs unto you, but unto us confusion of faces. Have you ever been outside the will of God and, and realized how, con, how the state of confusion yes. that you could be in? Yes. Lord, help us. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in confusion. Amen. Of faces at this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel that are near and that are far off through all the countries where you have driven them. So they're all dispersed. All of God's people dispersed all over the place, right? We're moving along because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against you. Oh, Lord, to us belongs confusion of face to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belongs mercy, forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed your law, even by departing that they might not obey your voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us and the oath that is written in the law of Moses. We don't really have time to go there, but look, well, I'll show it to you. Deuteronomy 27. We're not going to read it all, but I want you to see. Well, where are we right here? I don't, I don't want to lose my spot. On this. We're in Daniel chapter 11, in case I didn't put my little clip to go back. Daniel verse 11. Look at this stuff. We're not gonna we're not gonna read through all this because I can, I keep you here all night long. But I want you to know in in Deuteronomy 27. Now this is during the time frame of Moses. Okay, that's why it's important for us to understand chronology. We're going way back now. Daniel's 586 BC. The time frame of Moses is like 1450 BC. So we're about what is that about? I'm bad doing backwards math, but it's what is that, about 800 years. 800 years before Daniel's time. God told Moses, Cursed be the man that makes any graven image or molten image, an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the Christ. See, see what I'm saying? Moses, through Moses, God warned his people before they were ever in the land of Israel, don't do these things. 
And the reason I'm warning you is because I know that the people over there are doing it. And it's just like you and I, whenever we come into the, into the faith, we're either going to serve the Lord or we're going to serve the world. And listen, young people that are in school, and I know because I've been in school and even in college, guess what? The world is always going to keep on being the world. Amen. And the Lord says, come out from amongst them and be ye separate. He doesn't, it's not okay for God's people to be polluted with the world. All right? So you get the point there. So God warned them in, in Deuteronomy, but yet nevertheless, they did it anyway. And so God says, transgress your law. Even by departing, they might not obey your voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us. The oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges. You know, that, that, that word, that phrase that we talk about, you reap what you sow, that has meaning. Amen. It really does. God's going to see to it. But he's also merciful. And he, he's a God of restoration. Amen. That judged us by bringing upon us a great evil, for under the whole heaven has not been done as has been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore has the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works, which he does, for we obeyed not his voice. That's so powerful right there, man. I could preach on that for a whole week. Message. Sometimes we sit back and we wonder how things have turned out the way that they have in our life. And you know what Daniel just said? Daniel was so full of wisdom. He said, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works, which he does, for we obey not his voice. Don't sit there. Come on, Christian. I'm talking to the preacher. Don't you dare. Don't I dare sit there and start blaming the Lord when we see, when we see stuff that we know that he's allowing in our lives to bring chastisement. Right? right? Yeah. Whenever we find ourselves in our prayer closet and we see all this chaos going on in our life and all these things happening, let us not pretend that the Lord did not already nudge us beforehand, before all this stuff happened, to try to get our attention. Through the preacher, through the word, through whatever. You know he did. You, you know he, he's righteous in what he does. He's a good God. And he does it for our own good. Amen? To bring correction in our lives, right? The Lord our God that has brought your people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand. Look at that. He saved you. That's salvation right there, my friend. Don't forget that he saved you. And, and he's gotten you, re you renowned as, at this day. We have sinned. We have done wickedly. Oh, Lord, according to all your righteousness, I beseech you. Let your anger, your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are become a reproach. I mean, do it for your own name, Lord. Amen. To all that are about us. Now, therefore, O oh our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications and cause your face to shine upon your sanctuary that is desolate. Now, get that. It's burned down. The city's burned. The sanctuary is burnt. And Daniel's praying, Lord, please cause your face to shine upon your sanctuary that is desolate. Look at this. For the Lord's sake. And not, not fix it for me, Lord, so I don't have to be under Darius's hand anymore. That I don't have to serve him and hang out with all these magicians and astrologers. And when they can't figure out the dream, I got to get called down there. Here we go again. Uh, there's a God in heaven that can interpret it for you. And I got to hang out with all these occultic magicians. Not because of that, but no, for your glory, Lord. For your glory. Lord, change, change my life. Amen. Ch ch I mean, he has changed it. But change your best life. Change Shelby, Lord. And not, not for our glory, but for your glory. That when you change our heart and you change our lives, you get glory. Amen. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear and open your eyes and behold our desolations in the city, which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, hearken and do, defer not for thine own sake. O my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. And while, and look at this, this is where it changes. Now, I'm not going to keep you here much longer, because I told you this was going to take two installments. Next time, we're going to really focus on the prophecy of the weeks. Seventy sevens are determined upon your people, Daniel. We're going to really... Focus on that next Wednesday. But look, while I was speaking and praying, this is when it changes right here. 
While I was, did, did you hear that prayer though? Think about that. Let's just stop for a second and think about some of our own prayers. I don't know about, I'm not speaking for you. You probably got a much more passionate prayer life than me. But I'm just saying something. And sometimes my prayers are really passionate. You know what I'm saying? But then sometimes it's kind of, it's kind of like, you know, just throw one out there. Let's pray, you know, and, and throw it because we're tired. Oh, Lord, help us, right? But do you remember the description that Daniel had? I was in sackcloth. <laughs> You know what that means? He put him, he, he clothed himself in burlap. I understand you can't work it, but the concept of the Jew when he put sackcloth in himself was a, a sign of repentance. It was uncomfortable. You hear me? Whenever we're living in the midst of a situation now and we find ourselves in an uncomfortable situation, usually that's the best time to pray. You hear me? When you're hurting. When you feel heartache, when there's things that are going on and you're downtrodden. Look, when you take that heart right there and you bring it to the Lord, a broken and a contrite spirit, he will not despise. Daniel got a hold of the Lord. While he was praying, boom, something happened. While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man, we're talking about an angel now, his name is Gabriel, even Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. What does that mean, about 3 o'clock? <clears throat> there was an evening sacrifice. 9 o'clock was the morning sacrifice. Three o'clock was the evening sacrifice. He's over here praying at about the time, three o'clock in the afternoon, the angel Gabriel touched him. Oh, hallelujah. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill and understanding. I don't know about you, but I want skill and understanding in these last times. This whole vision that Daniel was given is all for you and I. Now, whether we see these last times, I don't, I'm not saying that we're going to see them. I don't know. But I guarantee you that we are at least in the beginning of the very end. I believe that. With all. Now, how long does the very end last? I don't know. I'm not going to give you a date because then I would be, in my, I'd be a false prophet as far as I mean. I ain't found a date yet. Okay? Give you skill and understanding at the beginning of your, in other words, when you first started praying, the commandment came forth, I am come to show you, for you are greatly beloved. Well, boy, look. You know what it means to be greatly beloved? You can't probably see it, but it says precious. Daniel was precious in the eyes of God. Can I tell you that you're precious in the eyes of God? You know how valuable you are in, in, in the eyes of the Lord? Now, this is just the truth. I ain't one of them feel-good preachers, but I'm here to tell you something right now. I want you to feel good about this. You know how precious you are and how valuable you are? God bankrupt in heaven and gave you Jesus. He, you, know, you know how valuable an object is? I heard this said before. It's you know how you can determine an object value? What somebody's willing to pay. God was willing to pay for you with the blood of Jesus. Um, uh, it, it doesn't get any better than that, my friend. That's how valuable you are in the eyes of God. Daniel was greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Look at this. <clears throat> this is where it is. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people and upon your holy city. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, I'm about to close. You ready? Now, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Now, let's just slow down for a second because that's a lot of information. So first of all, when the, when the decree goes forth to rebuild the city, we know. Now, I can't give you an exact date. Some of this I have read behind scholars, and I'm telling you the things that I have learned in the way that other men break some of this down. Because in order to really come to the dates properly, you have to go off of an old, like a Persian, whether it was a Medo-Persian calendar, then you got to be able to translate it into the Gregorian calendar. That's above my pay grade, my friend. I'm sorry. But what I am trying to tell you is, is that many a scholar agree that these weeks that's the first thing I want you to understand let me see if I can do this I'm gonna draw I'm gonna draw it on my little thing all right that these weeks 
weeks are actually years. Now, how do you break up years in sections in, in America or in English? What is 10? Deca, right? right? 10 is a decade. Sorry, I spoke wrong. Hmm. Seven for the Jew is called a heptad. All right? You got to trust me on this. All right. It's a heptad. So these weeks are literally units of years. It's not like a seven-day period. It's units of years. And so what we have here is we have 70 sevens. Okay? And so whenever we take 70, let's see how this, I'm over here talking, talking big. Let's see here. How do we do this? 70 times 7 equals what? 490. All right. A period of 490 total years. Now, we're going to pick this up when we come back. But what I want you to know is, is that from the going forth of the prophecy, from the going forth to rebuild Jerusalem, and I already mentioned it in my dialogue that I was talking about, Nehemiah the cupbearer, when he was in the presence of Cyrus, the Persian king, and his face was downcast. And Cyrus said, what's wrong with you? He said, my city is in ruins. Cyrus at that point gave him edict. Go back and build. And he gave him permission. Go back and build it. That's what the whole book of Nehemiah is about. Okay. Where they rebuilt the wall, began to rebuild the city. From that point until Messiah, if we go back and do the math and we'll look at it next week, had to do, there was a certain amount of time. And the time was this. 483 years according to scholars. Okay? I can't, I can't translate it for you. you got, I believe it. I believe it. They, they say really to the day. In other words, Cyrus said go build it and then 483 years later Jesus is cut off and Messiah is crucified. 483 years. So what does that mean? If you subtract 483 from 490, what do you leave? Seven. There's another seven year period that's unaccounted for. Since that time frame, since Jesus came, what did the prophecy say to Daniel? It said, it's 70 weeks are determined upon your people. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This is where many people also say that why they believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. And I will... I will concede to you that, that this last this prophecy had to do with the people of Israel. But that in and of itself, I'm just trying to make a point, does not mean that the church isn't going to experience any of this stuff. The Gentile world has constantly experienced things whenever Israel is experiencing things. But I will, I will understand why sometimes people come up with that. That's fine. And if that's how you continue to believe when it's all said and done, it's all good. We're not going to bump tomorrow. But, but what I want you to know is there's a seven-year period that's left. And from, the, from Messiah, from the, from the edict to rebuild the temple <clears throat> until Messiah was 483 years. Now we've been in the church age, right? I like the way Brad Bullock taught this the first time. I just, he just said something that, sounded, that was so cool. So there was, a stop, there was a stopwatch in the hand of God, if I could say it like that. You can see it like this. There's a stopwatch in the hand of God and he's waiting. Nehemiah walks into Cyrus's area to give him the cup. And Cyrus says, what's wrong with you? And as soon as he hands that edict to Cyrus, the time clock starts. All right. All the way for 483 years until the cutting off of Messiah. The time clock stops. Now we've been in this church age all this time. There's an event that takes place that restarts the time clock. And it's what we're going to read next week. Where the Antichrist confirms the covenant. Starts the time clock again for the last seven years. Hopefully that makes some sense. Next week we're going to break it down. I hope it makes some sense. It's a lot of information. I get it. But I want you to know that's where that seven years come from. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word, oh Lord God. Lord, you have put it there so that we could understand what's going on, Lord. You want to prepare your people. Your prophet Daniel was seeking your face, crying out to you, and he desired to know the truth. 
Lord, and you made him aware of it because you want people to understand. You want people to know what's going on, Lord. This is a lot of information, but Lord, we need to understand. We need to understand your word. And I pray that you would open our eyes, that we would be able to see. Lord, sometimes it's just the first time that we've experienced the information. And we got to keep reading. we got to keep studying. Sometimes it's years. Sometimes it's years before we really understand it. The first time I even heard this stuff was probably eight years ago. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand, Lord, and that you would supernaturally give us revelation. Lord, I pray for those that watch tonight on video. I pray for those that have been faithful in the church, that you'd help us all to have eyes to see and ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise amen. God. Thank you for your patience. I know that was a lot of info.